at year 35. Okay. Good morning, everybody. We have something very, very important to talk about. <laughs> Yeah, it's a repeat of last year. What you were asking about yesterday, but like it's for the people that don't know, this is not only like the best movie of the year, and I know it's only like March, right? Okay. But and I don't say this lightly, the best science fiction epic since 2001 A Space Odyssey. And in nerddom, those are fighting words. Right? Okay, so. Yeah, I highly recommend, if you haven't seen the first one, watch it, and then go and watch uh, do part two. You are in for a treat. This is how movies should be made. Um, I don't think the character development is all that smooth, but oh my gosh, sound design, music, visuals of this movie are incredible. Just incredible. You're in for a treat. It's. It's kind of, it's just, they're, they're long movies and they're a slow burn. So if you're expecting like Marvel action, there's action in the movies, but it's not, it, it, it's chef's kiss action. It's not gratuitous. Yeah. What do you think of the 1980s? Oh my gosh, that, that movie rocks. Um, for all the opposite reasons that this one rocks. So like, like the 1984 Dune is so bad it like breaks through the badness barrier and gets into the awesome side of badness, right? Okay. You know movies that are like so bad that they're good? Yeah. That's the 1984. Yeah. 1984 too did like horrible things to the to the novels, the, all that kind of stuff, but like, yeah, no. Anyway, um, thoroughly enjoyed that, that movie. You gotta go school. All right, uh, what are we doing? We are doing optics, and we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna do. Mr. Baylow is gonna take some time, okay? Because I think in a former life I was probably a history teacher. I just one of the great sadnesses that I have in teaching physics is we never seem to have time to talk about what's going on when all of these discoveries are being made. Like there's just a ton of history behind Newton's law, ton of history behind conservation of energy, thermodynamics, all this kind of stuff. And I want to teach you some of the history of light. This is my expertise. This is what I did in graduate school, not the history stuff, but, but light and the physics of light. And it's got a special place in my heart. But it's also, this is very important because I need to set up what's going to happen for the rest of the semester. Because you weren't aware of it when we started, but we're trying to answer a singular question. Not the question that was coming up. Not that question, but this question. It seems so easy, doesn't it? It seems so innocuous. I mean, what is light? Where, where does it come from? It's gone. It's back. It's, it's there, and we sort of just ignore it, and then we, it, it goes away at the sunset. Right? And we, we make more of it artificially, right? But we don't. This question has driven the science of physics since day one. Like, even before day one. So, so day one for physics is when Newton publishes the Principia. Okay? This is where his Newton's laws and all that kind of stuff. He followed up with another one called optics. Ten guesses as to what that one was about, <laughs> right? Okay, about the nature of light. And it's this question about what is light, what makes it up, that has driven all of the physics that we have been studying this semester. 
All of this electricity, all of this magnetism is going to come together today. And I want to give you context. So let's start with Mr. Big Hair himself. Okay? Isaac Newton really weighed in first on the nature of light. And according to Isaac Newton, light was a particle. Okay, so this is a history lesson. I know I'm taking time, so what do you, you guys want to know what's going to be on the test? I think it's perfectly reasonable for me to ask you, right? Who said this about light? Don't worry about dates. I'm not going to quiz you on dates or that kind of stuff, but I, it's, I think it's important enough, and that maybe I'll ask you on the exam, right? Which of the following people thought light was a particle? Because there's really kind of two answers to the question, okay? Light is either a particle or it's a wave. This, I mean, these are the two ways that physicists think about how the universe is put together. And, and in particular, right, what's sort of like the difference between a particle and a wave? We, we've already we studied this in 2A, right? If I take my tennis ball and I bounce it off of the wall, right, particles reflect, okay, they refract, but waves do two things that are really, really special. Does anybody remember what they were? There were four phenomenon, but only waves could do two of them. It's like a reach back into 2A. Do you remember interference, the overlap of two waves, where you get constructive interference and destructive interference? Only waves can be at the same place at the same time as another wave. The other one was diffraction. Okay? But reflection and refraction are both things that particles can, can, can do. And <clears throat> so you can't tell the difference. But Newton, in his coming up with ideas, believed and posited and theorized that light is a particle. He argued this because objects would cast sharp shadows, which is, you know, particles don't diffract around things. Um, he argued that uh, because of refraction, the changing of the direction of, say, throwing a rock into a piece of water changes direction, right? Light does the same thing, so it must be a particle. Um, he, he had lots of other arguments, okay? And in optics, he came up with this entire theory of the particle nature of light. Um, he would refer to particles of light as corpuscles. That's, uh, those of you who have done biology a little bit, right, uh, recognize that term. The Latin corpuscle just means little unit, small thing, okay? Um, but, but that was Newton's sort of idea. I, wanna, I could get more into it, right? But like, it, it's Isaac Newton, right? Like, like if Isaac Newton says that light is a particle, what does the rest of the scientific community do? Sir, yes, sir, right? It's like, this is the man that like figured out gravity, right? And the laws of motion. And, and, and his, his, it carries weight, right? Newton says it, therefore it must be. And the scientific community went, yes, light's a particle. And kind of didn't question it for the next 40 years. I mean, some would, but none, nobody would ever take it seriously until... In 1804-05, pun intended, a young British physicist would decide to challenge the status quo. So now we get the story of the rebel, right? Thomas Young was doing experiments, and we're going to talk about his experiments a little later. But he was doing experiments with light. And he was uh, shining light onto really, really tiny slits in uh, metals. And he was watching the patterns that would come through. And he identified these patterns, these black and white stripes that would appear on the screen in his lab. And he would look at those and go, oh my gosh, light isn't what we think it is. Because those light and dark patterns are interference patterns. Dark, where the light is destructively interfering with itself. Bright, where the light is constructively interfering with itself. This is not something that a particle can do. 
So what does Thomas Young now know? But he knows two things. What's the first thing he knows? It was wrong. <laughs> Newton's wrong. <laughs> right? Okay? And number two, he knows light's a wave. I mean, the, he's got observational, empirical, laboratory-based evidence for the interference of light. And waves are the only things that can be at the same place at the same time and interfere. So light must be a wave. This is a quote in 1801 as Thomas Young is actually moving towards this point in 1804 when he's going to tell the world, okay, that Newton is wrong, okay? Look, look at what he is saying here, right? <laughs> I respect Newton. Lays that out. Newton did some stuff, right? But that doesn't mean that Newton can't make mistakes. <gasps> Blasphemy. <laughs> right? I see with regret. So, so Thomas Young is expressing like, I don't want to do this, but I'm forced to do this. Right? That he was liable to err. <laughs> this is fancy, fancy cutting words for Newton made a mistake. And not only did Newton make a mistake, but what did he re what did he do? Retarded the progress. What is what is that? I mean, Thomas Young isn't calling him a retard. <laughs> but what what's he trying to say here? What does it mean to retard something? Slow it down. Thomas Young is trying to say, look, everybody. Just because Newton said something doesn't necessarily mean it's right. You do experiment, you find out. So far, Newton's laws, gravity, all that seems to be right. But when it comes to the nature of light, something else is going on here. Well, I'm going to make time in this until we're going to get so behind in this unit. <laughs> Thomas Young, 1804, is invited to the Paris Academy of Sciences, the yearly meeting of all of the big, fancy scientists in Europe, in really the world, but mostly Europe. And, um, and he is invited to give a lecture on the work that he is doing. And so this is, his, this is his moment. This is his chance to break out, right? This is his chance to like show the world. Newton's wrong. Light has wave-like properties. So he's giving a lecture to a room full of like two, three hundred physicists, right? And he's giving this lecture and he's laying out his evidence, right? And the room is becoming more and more tense because everybody can see where this is going, right? And then Thomas Young is like, and I think we have to, you know, think about the fact that Newton's wrong. At this point, the unthinkable happens. Somebody in the audience clears his throat <clears throat> and stands up. You do not do this at a scientific conference. When somebody is at the podium saying something, you wait for the question and answer session to fillet them on. Right? Okay? You don't do it while they're presenting their work. Okay? You want to you want to put them over the hot coals. You wait till the question and answer session. Then you really put the screws to it. Okay. But a physicist by the name of Simeon Poisson, which in French means fish. <laughs> okay. Stand up, older guy, like 50, 60, established in the scientific community. Everybody knows who Simeon Poisson is, right? Stands up, clears his throat, and says, "Excuse me." You're wrong. Can you imagine? Right? Can you imagine being Thomas Young, all 24 years old, I think, at this point? Right? And you've got venerated physicists standing up in the middle of everybody, right, saying you're wrong? It's like the worst nightmare, right? Okay? Thomas Young kind of holds his ground and says, experiment, right? And Poisson says, no, there's got to be something wrong here, right? 
And they start kind of getting into this back and forth. Well, this is like Victorian era times. And when gentlemen have disagreements, there's only one way to show who's right. And because men are idiots, they will go out into the street, pick a weapon, and go for it, right? And who's ever alive at the end must be right. Right? This is how this goes. Well, these two gentlemen were smarter than that, right? And they proposed a duel of experiments. Poisson standing there, because Thomas Young has explained his double slit experiment, right? Poisson says, okay, let's take your argument as valid. This is, this is something that scientists argue about all the time. Okay, let's pretend like that what you're saying is true. Therefore, if light is a wave, if we take a very small, say, spherical object and we suspend it in a beam of light, then those light beams will diffract or bend around this object and meet at the center in the shadow that is being created by that object, right? And all objects cast shadows, right? But Thomas Young, you're saying light's a wave. And so if light's a wave, then it should not only interfere, it should also diffract. And if diffraction's happening, we should be able to see the point in the shadow where there would be a bright spot where the light beams are meeting. I, Simeon Poisson, believe that that does not exist. Thomas Young said, you're wrong. I'm sort of summarizing a bunch of stuff here, right? Okay, they weren't that nasty to each other, right? But like, the room kind of split, okay? And there were two camps that arose. The side of Thomas Young was championed by a French uh, physicist uh, by the name of Augustin Fresnel, And he believed in Young's experiment. And he would go on and invent something called a Fresnel lens if you've ever been behind a um, school bus, there's a Fresnel lens on the back of the school bus. It's a special mirror type lens thing that lets the driver see like right below the bus in the blind spot. Anyway, you don't wanna know about Fresnel lenses. Um, but he takes up Thomas Young's like side, okay? Here's Poisson. <laughs> I think he looks a lot like um, Napoleon. Anyway. Um, <laughs> But they're, they're the ones that, and, and they like devise like a contest, right? And like people get to submit papers on either side, and so a few months go by, and they start, you know, they, they, they do, um, they, they, they review each other's papers, right? So, so it, it, it turns out to be sort of like the grudge match of the century, right? Okay? In one corner, you have Fresnel championing Thomas Young's work, and then on the other side, you got Simeon Poisson, who is not related to fish, but is championing Newton's side of the story, okay? And so, they get together, they devise Poisson's experiment, right? He, he had proposed this setup, right, okay? They do the experiment. And this is what Although like. light has properties similar to those of waves, the wavelength of light is so small that we seldom notice the wave-like nature of light. This pinpoint light source will allow us to demonstrate that wave-like nature. If we put the light source behind a small sphere, and look at the light coming past the sphere, we see a pattern around the edges caused by interference between different waves of light. Notice the bright spot in the center of the sphere where we would normally expect no light at all. It's really, really faint, but it's there. To this day, that spot that exists in the shadow of very small objects and beams of light is called Poisson's spot. <laughs> <laughs> Not because physicists want to get back at each other, although they do, okay? But why? Why is it called Poisson's spot? He was the first to publish work explaining the mechanism 
behind which it would happen. Even though he believed it wouldn't. He was using the argument as of this can't happen. What's on the spot? Not Fresnel's spot or Young's spot. Oh, history is cruel. We're going to talk later about Ernest Rutherford. Ernest Rutherford hated chemists. <laughs> really just did not like chemists. Considered chemistry not science, but stamp collecting. He actually called chemistry stamp collecting, okay? When Ernest Rutherford won the Nobel Prize, what did he win the Nobel Prize in? Chemistry. <laughs> Karma. All right. So, what have we established now? Doom's wrong, lights a wave, right? See, see, I could have just started class and said, well, light was a particle and then it was a wave, and then, right? But this is juicy, right? This is, this is like, this stuff going on, right? Okay? N not death yet. Yet. Never. Um, but now we gotta talk about black and white photos. Because after Thomas, so, so news working 1740, 1750, like the portrait, right? Thomas Young comes around 1801, 1804, right? Drops this bomb. And by the way, this rocks the scientific community in physics. Like, like people split, and there's like fighting words. There's like, there's like, so the big problem, the big problem, that the wave people had to overcome is how does the light get from the sun to the earth? What's between the sun and the earth? Space. Nothing, right? Space is empty. What do waves need in order to propagate? A medium. There needs to be something for the wave to be traveling through. So the people that were believing in the wave like nature of light had to establish what the medium of light was. And so they did. They called it the luminiferous ether. <laughs> Good name, right? PR department worked hard on that one. <laughs> Have you heard of the ether? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, what's the ether? <laughs> it's stuff, okay? It's the stuff that light travels through. Where is it? It's everywhere. What does it look like? Don't know. What does it taste like? Don't know. Can you measure it? No. But it must be there. Does this sound like science? Sounds like philosophy, doesn't it? <laughs> so they invented the ether, and then they came up with uh, some experiments, actually, to detect the presence of the ether. It took more than 60 years to show that the ether didn't exist. It has been called the greatest null result or null hypothesis, hypothesis in all of science. It's easy to prove something happened. It's really hard to prove that it doesn't. And part of that story is going to come to light later. Oh, see what I did there? Okay, what's going on with black and white photos? Black and white photos are invented around 1850-ish, okay? And uh, scientists start playing around with the cameras, and they notice that um, you, can, you can adjust the amount of light that comes into the camera through something called the shutter. And the, the amount of time that the shutter's open determines how much light goes into the camera. So, so now we have an experimental apparatus that can capture light. This is like, this is a big deal, right? And it, 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 I mean, it's, yeah, it's the beginning of TikTok, but it's like, it's like, we can now capture light. And so the scientists are all over this. They're like, okay, okay, what happens if we send a little bit of light in? What is it? It's dots! And what kind of things make dots? Make me No! Because if it was a wave, what would it look like? 
A wave encodes all the information in the wave. So if you let just a little bit in, what should we see if it were a wave? You see the whole thing. Only really, really faint. But all the information should be there. Is all the information there? No! What is it? It's a particle. Individual particles striking the film. little chemicals in the wave. If it were a wave, it would encode everything. It would just be faint not individual little pieces. So what happens if you let a little bit more light in, huh? 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 We can kind of start seeing what the picture is. What is the, what is the picture of? Can you see it? It's a face, right? Okay. Can you see the it's kind of mouth and the eye a little bit, right? Okay. And if we let all the light in, but the point here is, <laughs> that the light comes in discrete little chunks. And what are discrete little chunks? What is going on? Like, really, what is going on? We now have two pieces of experimental evidence that are at direct odds with each other. Thomas Young's experiments that showed unequivocally, light interferes, only waves do that. And now the photographic evidence suggesting that light comes into street chunks, and that's particles. By the way, you can do this digitally and get the same result. Doesn't matter what the sensor is, whether it's chemical film, or digital sensor. This is this picture's reversed, but a little bit more, and then finally all. This was a pattern of like they showed at the sensor. Both can't be right. So now, well, we're going to spend the next three and a half weeks on the now what? Because you have been learning a series of ideas that all lead to this person. This person knew how to grow a beard. <laughs> James Clark Maxwell. I know, I know, I know how it's spelled. Okay, but I'm using the correct pronunciation. He was Scottish, right? And, and in Scotland, you pronounce that word Clark. Okay, so James Clark Maxwell came along and summarized everything we know about electricity and magnetism. Now I'm going to show you some equations. And um, your brain's going to shut off, okay? And you're going to panic, okay? Because there'll be a part of your brain that's still alive that says, oh my gosh, I need to know this. I have no idea what it means. No, 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 no. no. You, don't, you don't have to worry. You don't have to worry. But I am required by my oath to all things physicsness to show this to every human being I, I come across. It's just, I think that everybody in their life at some point should see Maxwell's equations because they are beautiful, because they are amazing, because they tell a story. And, and you know, you know you've made it when you can get it on Etsy, <laughs> right? Okay, what, what the heck? What the heck is going on? 
I really want to show you something, but I'm not going to because it involves a lot of calculus and a lot of math on the board. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to ask you to just trust me that the result that we're get your calculator down that the result we are about to do okay comes from a whole lot of putting this together. Okay. So what did Maxwell do and why are these called Maxwell's equations? You already know one of these equations, okay? The very top one, even though it doesn't look like it to you, is Gauss's law. I know you probably don't want to remember Gauss's law, but we did study Gauss's law. Electric flux, right, and charges and all that kind of stuff. The second one is Gauss's law for magnetism. That one's interesting because it says that it equals zero. That actually, that, that funky upside down delta with a dot product, that's actually a way of talking about something called divergence. And Gauss's law for magnetism very importantly tells us that magnetic fields form closed loops. That, that's what that statement says. You actually can't use it for anything, but it's an important, this is what magnetic fields do. Gauss's law tells us that it's not equal to zero, it means it doesn't form closed loops, but it makes bad hair day pictures, right? That um, del cross E right here, changing magnetic field over time, that's actually Faraday's law of electromagnetic induction. Remember we did change in flux over time, okay? So that's actually Faraday's law of electromagnetic induction. And then this last one down here I didn't talk about, but this is called Ampere's law, which is kind of like a Gauss's law for magnetism. I, I, I touched on it just a little bit in passing, but, but what we've been hiding from you for eight weeks of the semester are really you've been trying to learn four things, okay? Electric fields and their, what they look like, magnetic fields and what they look like, the fact that a changing magnetic field can generate a circulating electric field, and the fact that a changing magnetic field can cause current to flow. So these principles together are called Maxwell's equations because Maxwell codified them, actually corrected a mistake in Ampere's law, not a mistake, but an oversight in Ampere's law. And the thing that fell out, the result that I can summarize for you is this. And you're like, so? What the heck is that? One over the square root of mu naught times epsilon naught. What is one over the square root of mu naught? What, what's mu naught? You remember what mu naught was? Four pi times ten to the minus seven, right? Okay. So we're going to take the square root. It was that. That's a twelve point. Is that twelve point three? Twelve point one? What's four times pi? You guys have calculators, what is it? 12.56, 12.7. 12.7 times 10 to the minus seven. So there's the mu naught, okay? And then epsilon naught is 8.85 times 10 to the negative 11. It's a good thing I wrote these things down. Negative 12. Put that in your calculator. Don't tell me what you get until I ask for it. Remember, Maxwell is putting together these equations, the equations that govern everything we know about electricity and magnetism, and this is what has fallen out. A lot like that apple that didn't fall out of the tree and didn't hit Newton on the head. <laughs> Have we got this number yet? I know how it starts. It starts with two points. And then what comes next? Nine eight. Keep it. Two point nine eight. Two. Two. Eight. One. One. Six. Two. Seven. Uh, we have period yet? No? No, that's all the things in my calculator. Yeah, there we go. Period. 
okay? And then maybe more numbers, okay? Or, if we want it around, 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. It is the speed of light. Maxwell has discovered what light is. Light travels at that speed. And that speed only exists in the mathematical description of an electric and magnetic field coming together as a wave. When Maxwell put together these equations, he discovered a wave equation. And the speed that that wave traveled at was the speed of light. Maxwell had discovered something called the electromagnetic spectrum a wave in the electric and magnetic fields. And I know you recognize some of these things. He discovered that what we know as light is a very small portion of a much bigger family of electromagnetic waves. Their frequencies and their corresponding wavelengths determine their utility or what they can be used for. But notice that the visible portion of the spectrum is this itty bitty teeny tiny little piece up there. <laughs> And there's all, all of this stuff that we can't see with our eyes, but we can receive. What has Maxwell discovered? What are radios, x-rays, gamma rays, microwaves, and the ovens we use the microwaves in? I mean, he didn't make microwave ovens, but Maxwell cracked open the egg on the science that would let engineers come up with these incredible, incredible tools. It is a miracle that you can put food into a box and a minute later get a popcorn out! That is something that a hundred years ago you would be put on trial as a magician <laughs> if you tried to do. Like, seriously, our world has changed so much. James Clark Maxwell came up with this electromagnetic spectrum in the wave theory of light. Am I right? Am I right? See, the engineers even agree. <laughs> you can hear the screen. I can't, I can't oversell this enough. He has discovered in the mid-1850s an idea that would then let an Italian engineer scientist the last name of Marconi, not Macaroni, Marconi, send the world's first wireless transmission across the English Channel in the late 1880s. He had never looked back, ever. When I see Maxwell's equations, again, I think Granted, I'm trained in them, right, okay? I have used these over and over and over again. They are as familiar, okay, as my pillow and soft blanket, right? 
as they are now as comforting. They didn't used to be. They used to be horrible. But now, oh my gosh, when I see these equations, it's hard to not get emotional. Not because of the trauma I experienced in grad school, okay? <laughs> but because Maxwell's equations show me, tell me why. Rainbows happen. And why clouds are white and the sky is blue. Why sunsets and sunrises make all of those colors. How those waves of light can make it to my eyes and be turned into an electrical signal that can be sent to the mess that is my brain. how DVDs work, how we can send stuff down fiber optics, why milk is white and water is clear and how I can see your beautiful faces. It's all, it's all Maxwell's equations. There's an explanation in those equations for all of those phenomena and more. Everything that you've done so far this semester can be explained in those four equations. It's incredible. It's elegant. When physicists talk about the universe being beautiful, this is what we mean. I, I am moved every morning that I drive in and I get to see that sunrise coming up over the top of the Sierras. I love it. It never ceases to amaze me. My first reaction is, oh my gosh, it worked again. Okay? And then secondly, my appreciation for the beauty that is that sunrise isn't lessened because of the math or what I know about how it's all working. It magnifies it. It helps me appreciate it even more. And what we're going to do is we're going to spend the next three weeks figuring out why all of the things I just mentioned happened. This is why I became an optical physicist. I wanted to know, what is light? Where does it come from? Where is it going? How do we use it? to do amazing, amazing things. This story is not done. I'm going to pick this story up again in three and a half weeks. Okay? And spoiler alert, this is where we're going. What a tangent, <laughs> but an excellent one, and one that is going to be important for the context in motivating you and explaining why I will start crying, okay, <laughs> when we get the thin film interference. It's just, it's going to be amazing. All right, so just a, just a couple more things, okay? Um, it, it can be fun to poke fun at, you know, past history. And say, oh, it's so stupid. They believe in living in the future. We all know that that doesn't exist. Okay, well, you live in an age when we teach kindergartners that atoms exist, right? Um, <laughs> we, <laughs> right? It's, like, it's absolutely incredible to me, right? Let's start with quantum mechanics. Why not? It's fine. Good. We understand it. Adults don't, but kindergartners do. They not believe anything you tell them. <laughs> Things like one plus one equals two. Um, I, I was in. I was in my senior level electricity and magnetism course. So this is, this is the, I'm not in graduate school yet. I'm a senior in college, right? This is the second time I'm taking electricity and magnetism. So like, we're really like, the training wheels have come off. There's all kinds of horrible math that's going on, all this kind of stuff, right? And so uh, Dr. Spencer, my teacher, he would come in and the room that had chalkboards all the way around the room. 
and they'd move the desks away from the walls so that the teachers could write on that board and then write on that board and write it. So Dr. Spencer would come in, he'd start lecturing, he'd start over there, and he would just start lecturing, and we were madly trying to keep up with Dr. Spencer, right? Math, 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 right, right, all the, and he would get to that board over there, right? There wasn't one on the back wall, right? And he'd jump over this board and he'd start erasing and writing at the same time, okay? <laughs> And, and, and we would measure how bad lecture was in number of loops around the room that Dr. Spencer took. Like a good lecture was like 1.1 boards. But if you ever got beyond a three board lecture, and that's three times around the room, I mean, give up. Like abandon all hope. You ain't going to, like, like, it was bad, okay? So we were used to this kind of um, abuse. And um, he came in one day, and he didn't start over there. He walked up to the front of the room, and he just stood there. And we're like, what's wrong, Dr. Smith? And he's like, I'm going to do something a little bit different today. I'm going to prove to you that the luminiferous ether exists. Uh, we know this story, Dr. Spencer. We know that that's not true. Like, why, why are we gonna waste time? He's like, I'm gonna prove to you it exists. He started over there, okay? And by the time he got here, we were all of us 100% believers. <laughs> okay? He had shown us the light. We knew it to be true because it was beautiful. It was elegant. It explained everything. And it didn't require all that horrible math that we had been learning in his class. And he got to hear. And he stood back. He says, that's amazing. Too bad it doesn't exist. Threw his chalk in the trash can and walked out. <laughs> We were destroyed. <laughs> we had been shown the way to nirvana and had been ripped off. <laughs> I knew in that moment why they fought so long to keep the luminiferous ether there. It was amazing. But when it comes to science, when there is no experimental evidence, when the ether theory says that you should be able to go and measure this thing, and over and over and over again, you can't measure it. Even though you build machines that are 10,000 times more precise than you need to be, and you still can't find it. What are you forced to admit? Figment of our imagination. You gotta go back and do reads though. And vessel functions. And everything else. <laughs> <laughs> James Clark Maxwell was able to show that to form this wave, it did not need to be traveling through anything. The ether did not need to exist in James Clark Maxwell's formulation. Don't panic, you're gonna see some calculus here, okay? But this is a more of a conceptual overview of Maxwell's equations, kind of where they've come from. You'll notice something. But what I want you to see is the wave that is made. The electric flux through any closed surface is equal to four pi k sub e times Q, or Q over epsilon naught, where Q is the total charge enclosed by the surface. And the magnetic flux through any closed surface is always equal to zero. out, comes back in.
These are Gauss's laws for electricity and magnetism. The circulation of magnetic field around any closed path is equal to mu naught times the electric current passing through that path. This is Ampere's law. The circulation of electric field around any closed path is equal to minus the rate of change of magnetic flux through that path. This is Faraday's law of electromagnetic induction. So suppose that there can be a wave in the intensity of the electric field. That's the electric field wiggling up and down. This one's a transverse plane wave. And it travels, of course, at the speed of light. But consider the field at any one instant. Since it's up in one region and down in the next, it has a circulation about this path. According to Faraday's law, that means that there must be magnetic flux through that same path, and furthermore, that it must be changing in time. And that can only mean one thing. A magnetic wave must tag along with the electric wave everywhere it goes. So if the electric field is wiggling up and down, like a transverse wave that we studied in physics 2A, right? waves on a string kind of thing, right? But instead of a string, we use the electric field, okay? So the electric field is big somewhere, but right next to it, it's small, and then it's big down to the right. We can do the peaks and troughs inside of that field. Faraday's law comes along and tells us if the Electric flux is changing. There must be a changing magnetic flux. And how is that magnetic flux oriented compared to the electric field? Perpendicular. And that means that the wave can propagate through the electric and magnetic fields and doesn't need an ether at all. So the medium is the magnetic flux? The medium is the field. Electric and magnetic fields. You are seeing a light wave. What is light? It's coupled electric and magnetic fields wiggling together. One of them perpendicular to the other, traveling at what speed? <laughs> the speed of light. The one universal constant we know doesn't change no matter what. So electromagnetic waves can be, I mean, they're kind of hard to draw, right? They're in three dimensions. Notice that you have your electric field and your magnetic field, and then the propagation direction was perpendicular to both of those, and yes, I used my right hand, right, okay? <laughs> How do we draw this, right? Well, the answer is we really don't draw this, <laughs> okay? What we do is we try to mathematically describe what's going on and no panicking, okay? But what we're going to do is we are going to set waves in the electric field and magnetic fields. For those of you that are having trouble in Remember Physics 2A, which I'm sure is everybody, okay? We had a function, a mathematical way to describe a wave. And it involved position in time. And there were some sort of little, little things that went on here. When there was a minus sign inside of that, when it was kx minus omega t, do you remember what direction it was going? 
It's not what you think. If it's minus, the wave is moving in the positive x direction. And if I write plus, kx plus omega t, it's moving the other way. Does, it, does that jiggle any neurons loose? A little tiny bit, okay. Then there was omega. You've seen omega already in this class, right? Okay. The angular frequency is equal to 2 pi times the frequency, linear frequency measured in hertz, right? Omega is in radians per second. Frequency is in hertz, which is an inverse second, okay? And then we had the wave number k. I'm so sorry about k. k is used everywhere, isn't it? Right? But this was 2 pi over the wave length. Oh, dear. What was wave length? Well, lambda, but we're like, what is it? How do you measure it? Peak to peak distance, right? Trough to trough, peak to peak. Pick any two points on a wave that is, are exactly the same, and you get that distance, and that's, that's the wave length. And then there was the master equation that related wavelength, frequency, and how fast waves travel with each other. And then remember, this was a little bit of a trap because this is an actually a relationship between the speed and frequency, or the speed and wavelength. The speed of a wave depends on the medium in which the wave is traveling. What medium is light traveling through? What are mu naught and epsilon naught? I gave you, I told you something about, like, if epsilon naught is somewhere, what do you know? The electric field is hiding somewhere, right? This is the, this is the constant that sets the strength of the electric field. What's mu naught sort of a dead giveaway for? Magnetic field, right? It's right here, right? Light is electric and magnetic fields coupled together. That is the medium to which light travels. And so the speed of light is set by those constants. Does the speed of light change compared to moving in a vacuum, which is what these knots, these sub-zeros here mean, okay? Versus say moving in air or water or glass? The answer is yes, because these constants change depending on what material light is traveling in. But the fastest light will ever go is in the vacuum of space. And it is that number, 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. It'll slow down when it goes into other materials, other mediums, because the speed of a wave depends on the medium in which it travels. Those electric and magnetic fields get affected by air and water and glass and everything else. This is why internet not so good in portions of your house. The Wi-Fi signal drops off as it is attenuated by the materials that your house is made up of or the microwave oven causing interference. But the speed that we will use for electromagnetic waves is what? The speed of light. Symbol lowercase c. When you see lowercase c, it's 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. So this means <laughs> that all of our wave theory now is coming back from 2a. Don't panic. Don't panic. It's going to be okay, right? This is about as difficult of like remembering the wave theory is going to get. Okay, because we're actually not going to use these equations at all, except on this slide. Okay, but I had to I had to connect it back. Okay, the form of this function is um, amplitude sine or cosine kx, you know, minus plus omega t. Right. So this is the amplitude. These e maxes and these b maxes would be the amplitude. Remember, in a wave, amplitude is that maximum distance 
from the equilibrium portion that we get, right? So it's like the strongest that the electric field and magnetic field will ever be. Well, another relation that falls out of putting all of this stuff together is the ratio between the amplitudes of the electric and magnetic fields is the speed of light. Like it, it, just, it just keeps always pointing at light. It just does. What about this spectrum? I showed you this picture already. I'm going to show it to you again. Okay. This spectrum comes from that relationship. We know the speed of light, and we know frequency and wavelength can interchange. Right? And that this relationship is really the relationship between frequency and wavelength, that they are inversely related to each other. In other words, the higher the frequency, the bigger this frequency number gets, what happens to the wavelength? It gets shorter, it gets smaller, doesn't it? Which means that the peaks are squeezing together. But if the wavelength gets bigger or longer, what happens to the frequency? It goes down. So from here on out, when I say light, I am not just talking about the stuff we see with our eyeballs. I am talking about any form of electromagnetic radiation of any wavelength and any frequency. Some of which you have run into. I, I know you've heard of radio, right? Okay. And microwave, not the appliance, but a part of the electromagnetic spectrum, a sort of a definition of region, as it were. Okay. And then there's visible light, x-ray. You've heard of ultraviolet light. What does ultraviolet light do to your skin on a summer day? Sunburn. Gives you a sunburn, right? It's of a frequency and wavelength that causes the cells on your skin to die. What is infrared? Where have you heard that term? What, what do you experience when you are being exposed to infrared light? Heat. Those are the frequencies and wavelengths that we feel as heat, that transfer of energy via electromagnetic waves. We talked about that in physics today. This is the first day of the end of your life. Isn't it all two A's coming back to haunt you? Right? Don't worry, we're not doing Newton's laws or kid maths. Okay? So let's talk, let's talk visible portion of the spectrum. Um, um, what, are the, what are the colors, Rainbow? Roy G. Bill. Who the heck is Roy G. Bill? He was a colorful man. All right. So, um, what is, what, is, what is this supposed to remind us of? Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo. What's indigo? There's only one thing I can think of when I hear the word indigo. Okay? Hello. Oh, that's a Diego. Diego. You killed my father. <laughs> what color is indigo? And shame on you if you don't know that reference. <laughs> Princess Pride is one of the best films of all time. Okay, it's like it, it's in between violet, which is purple, and blue. So whatever that color is between those two cassettes. Anyway, uh, I, I just, I think Newton was trying to, he couldn't figure out what color was either. All right, so um, these are the orders of the colors of the rainbow, okay? But they, they go, they have frequency and wavelength associated with them. Every color has its own frequency and wavelength. That's how we know they are different colors. That's how our eyes respond to. We're going to get more into biology of light later. You can make fun of my lack of biological knowledge. Okay? But as you go from red to violet, the frequency increases. 
Blue light has higher frequencies than red light. So what can you tell me about the wavelength? As you go from, from so like, what, compare red light to violet light. Which of these two has the bigger wavelength? Red. It's red, because this would be a small frequency, right? And a high frequency over here, which means that the red must have big wavelength, short wavelength, right? Which means that the wavelength increases as you go to the red orange of the spectrum. But again, this is just visible light. In terms of wavelength, and there's some argument about this, but this is the general, you can just use these, okay, uh, as a rough estimate. The wavelength of visible light is approximately 400 to 700 nanometers. Green is like 550 nanometers, okay? Anything outside of this range, our eyeballs are not sensitive to. We simply can't pick it up. We don't see infrared. Infrared, what does infra mean? Bigger than or longer than or beyond, okay? The red, meaning we're getting to bigger wavelengths but smaller and smaller frequencies, okay? Radio waves can have wavelengths measured in kilometers or meters, okay? The microwaves that make up your microwave oven have wavelengths measured in centimeters. You can't see it with our eyes, but oh man, water molecules get really happy when they're near those, okay? So, and then we can go the other way, right? We can go into x-rays. X-rays! Oh, oh! X-rays! You mean I can go to the doctor and they don't have to bleed me to let the demons out? <laughs> They can actually see inside my body without having to let all of the demons out? That's incredible. It's amazing. Don't do it every day. <laughs> but x-rays, they don't care about human flesh. They'll go right through it. But what stops an x-ray? Turns out the calcium and fluoride and a bunch of other stuff that's in our bones, right, will stop that x-ray. My graduate work was done in extreme ultraviolet optics. They also called us soft x-ray physicists. But I lived in the boundary between ultraviolet and x-rays. It was a place that few physicists dared to go. But we were bold enough and kind of dumb and naive enough to think we could do it. More on that story later. Gamma rays, boy, gamma rays will come after you. They're, they're all over the place, okay? But this entire spectrum, right, we can really find out what any frequency and wavelength is. If we know the frequency, we know the wavelength, and vice versa. They're related through the speed of light. Um, I want to show you a demonstration about waves. We'll get back to the energy carried by waves. You can look up the energy carried by the energy carried by the magnetic wave. Uh, I'm going to show you an absolutely wonderful piece of technology and I'm still sad. It's gone away. We had to label this one so that they wouldn't take it from us. Like, you're throwing all those out. Look at that, I know. We need it for demonstration purposes. This is an overhead projector. Okay, you can see here it's throwing light and whatever I write on here we get up on there, right? Now it just is a lot more expensive and involved in cooking. Um, but I have uh, uh, <laughs> See that? Kind of a great piece of plastic. This is called a polarizer. Okay. What a polarizer does is it forces, so, so light looks like that, right? Okay, it's a wave electric magnetic field. If we kind of look at it like as it's coming towards us, right? And this is just the electric field. We, we didn't draw the magnetic field for clarity, okay? The, the light is like that. So light coming at you is completely unpolarized, meaning that 
The electric field can be wiggling straight up and down or horizontally or at some angle and an infinite number of angles all the way around, okay? So there can be lots and lots of planes on which that electric field vector is wiggling. So in this picture, like in the right, in the left hand picture, the, the wave is like the electric field is wiggling like this, right? And we automatically know that the magnetic field's where? Perpendicular to it, okay? So we, we always just draw the electric field, right? So coming out, you're like, hey, coming out, like, hey, right? What a polarizer does is it forces the light to only wiggle in one plane, like the picture on the right, okay? So right now, unpolarized light. If I slap this down, I now get polarized light going through that piece of plastic, okay? And it's like, it's like the, 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 it's like the light trying to get through a fence, okay? If the light wiggles in the right direction, it can pass through the fence. But if the light is wiggling up and down, but the fence is horizontal, it's gonna kill it, right? So let's pretend right now that this polarizer is forcing the light to be vertically polarized, meaning that it's only going straight up and down, okay? And if it's gonna be vertical or horizontal, I just, I'm saying this one vertical, okay? And now, okay, so first thing you notice is what happens to the intensity of the light. It decreased, didn't it? Okay. I wiped out, on average, 50% of my light. Because on average, statistically speaking, unpolarized light is 50% up and down and 50% horizontal. That covers everything, right? So by statistically wiping out 50%, by forcing it to be vertically polarized only, I've wiped out 50% of my intensity. So there's a 50% reduction in intensity. Now I put another polarizer on top of it. What happened? Nothing. I mean, a little bit darker, so the plastic isn't the perfect transmitter of the light. But I didn't, like, basically what I've got here, okay, is two fences that are oriented the same way. The light goes to the bottom one, it's vertically polarized, and they can go through the second one because it is also vertically polarized, right? Watch what happens as I rotate. How much light's getting through now? None. Like that second picture over there. You cannot do this with particles. This only works if light is a wave. I can get in between these. <laughs> See that? Right? Okay. You, you stare at these all day long. You're like, no, I don't, Mr. Bell. I'm not weird like that. <laughs> Did that thing go on? Ah! 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 <laughs> What's happening? Is there a polarizer in this screen? Yeah! How many of you ever wondered why you can't see your laptop screen with your sunglasses on? Because <laughs> you have polarized sunglasses, okay? Why would you have polarized sunglasses? These aren't sunglasses, but they can be. What are these? These are 3D movie glasses, okay? How do you make 3D movies work? Magic. <laughs> If you've ever taken your eyes off of a 3D movie and looked at it, there's blurry on the screen, right? There's two images being projected simultaneously. One of those images has to go into one eye, and the other image, which is offset just a little bit in space, has to go into your other. That's how we see three dimensions, right? So how do they broadcast two pictures at the same time, but only this eye sees one of them and this eye sees the other? Polarization. Different polarizations. It used to be different colors, red and blue for black and white, but now it's polarizers, and actually, <laughs> They're elliptically polarized. Pretend I didn't tell you that. Okay? If you take 
A pair of these sunglasses. Go down flat, okay? And you take another one and you put it at a right angle. Okay? It's just that one of these is vertical and the other is horizontal. In a standard pair of sunglasses, you want them both to be uh, vertically polarized for a reason that we're going to talk about next time. But how do you know if the person at the sunglass hut is trying to rip you off <laughs> by selling you a pair of polarized sunglasses that didn't actually polarize? How do you prove it? To grab another pair of exactly the same kind, turn them at 90 degrees to each other and overlay the lenses. What should happen if it's polarized? It should go dark. Yes, I am that person in the dollar store. <laughs> All right, I will see you on Thursday where we get to do all kinds of light stuff. I can't wait.